There we go. Oh, and Sean just joined us. Excellent. Right, right hey, Sean. Hey, how are you doing? Good, how are you? I'm doing good. We're just about to get started. So um, Dustin's going to go ahead and introduce the Hangout, and then we're going to each get a chance to introduce ourselves and then go ahead and have our conversation here. So does that sound good? Wonderful. Do you have any questions before we get started? No, just a hello for everyone. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> and we can cut we can cut this very beginning off when we mm -hmm. actually post it. So. Okay, I'll get us started and we can jump into it. Sounds good. All right. Well, welcome everyone to this week's uh, hangout. This is a, a series of, of hangouts that we we've been doing for the past couple of years. Um, that's part of the work that's emanating out of Pittsburgh uh, through the Remake Learning Network. Um, and this is a network of more than 200 organizations around Pittsburgh that are sort of reimagining learning in many different ways. Um, and the, the 27 hangouts that we've now had um, with this group um, have all been about games and interactive technology and hands-on projects um, and how, how those elements are helping to reimagine learning uh, for our times. Um, and so today we have uh, some really special guests. Um, that are going to speak to the notion of games in the classroom, um, particularly how games are uh, manifesting themselves in, in education. Um, so uh, welcome, and with that, maybe we can pass it down the line and introduce ourselves and then uh, jump into the conversation. So Nikki, do you want to get started? Sure. So um, my name is Nikki Navta, and I'm the CEO of a company called Zulama. <laughs> Um, we worked with faculty at Carnegie Mellon here in Pittsburgh to develop a program that schools are using to teach game design um, in, in middle and high schools. So <clears throat> as part of our program, students do play games, um, and in playing games, they learn about different game mechanics, and that better informs them when they go ahead and start making their own games. So we sort of take the idea of using games in the classroom, not only just as playing games, maybe, um, but also as the act of creating games. How about you, Todd, you next? Yeah, I'll go. Hello, my name is Todd Karushkin. I'm the assistant superintendent at Elizabeth Ford School District. We're located about 45 minutes south of Pittsburgh, and uh, I've been here for the last seven school years. And with last, really the last four years, we started to introduce gameplay in, in schools. Uh, we have a small lab, uh, which is an embodied learning lab that we work with Carnegie Mellon University's Entertainment Technology Center uh, to develop games around content that our kids struggle with. And um, we've really been working with our teachers about the word failure. And you know, when gameplay is occurring, kids can fail in a game, but they continue to play and play and play until they master that game. And so we're really focusing on educational games with, within our school. We also use a, a, um, a game-based kind of learning called eSpark Learning. It's a company out of Chicago where it gives kids, uh, it's personalized learning, but it basically, basically gives kids quests to, to learn um, and to conquer um, around each of the kids' weaknesses. And it's really apps uh, that they play, game-based apps, educational apps that they play, um, using their iPads. Uh, our district is a K-12 iPad school. We are a Digital Promise League of Innovative Schools and Apple has recognized us as a distinguished program. So just a little overview of uh, Elizabeth Ford School District. They're one of the star school districts in western Pennsylvania and in the whole country as far as we're concerned. Thank you. <laughs> How about you Sean? Do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, so I'm uh, Sean Dickers, and I'm at Bethel University now. Uh, originally, though, most people know me from, from working with Kurt Squire at the University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, as one of his junior grad students. Uh, so I've graduated a little bit, um, and I'm a fanboy of Lee Sheldon. So um, <laughs> the thing I'm going to talk about today has been the result of reading your book, Lee. Um, and, and I hope you bought it and didn't get it in the library. <laughs> it's, on, it's on the shelf, I think, right in here somewhere. Oh yeah, right uh, so yeah, and and really reading that book and then starting to ask the question, well, well, how can I do this in my classroom as a higher ed professor, and how can I have start playing with some of these ideas as designing a class as a game, um, and creating an entire curriculum that is is more game like and to be played by the students, um, versus other things. So I think that's that's a good basic background, or at least I what think. What classes do you teach right now? So right now I'm teaching Ed Psych, 
Um, and previously, I've done educational technology and intro to education and really teacher prep classes. Okay. So helping teachers get ready to uh, look at designing their classrooms. And Excellent. So you're turning out the next teachers who can go work at Elizabeth Forward, in other words. <laughs> That's exactly what we're doing. And, and really, if you look at like Katie Salen and, and work with, with Quest to Learn, mm -hmm. you know, when I talked to Brendan Trolley there, one of the things they're working on is how do we get teachers to come into these kinds of environments and be ready to go. Right. So at Bethel, we're really trying to transform our teacher ed program to prepare for educator for teachers to be educators in a variety of different contexts. Well, and we're you know Zulama has shares that same uh, you know basic you know concern. I mean, one of the huge parts about our pr program is teacher training. Really, just getting teachers on board with the idea that this is a great way to teach. Uh, you know, for all the wonderful reasons why and. And helping them understand that, um, you know, project-based learning and being able to facilitate interest-driven learning is a fantastic way to to run your classroom. But anyway, let's finish with our intros. Lee, would you like to go ahead? Uh, okay. Uh, my name is Lee Sheldon. I have recently uh, joined Worcester Polytechnic Institute after. Five years at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. I seem stuck with Polytechnic Institute. Um, I am, I've been a, an educator for the past, I'm in my 10th year now, so I can't really say for only a, a period of time. It's been a while. Um, before that, I was a writer-producer in Hollywood. Um, everything from Charlie's Angels to Star Trek The Next Generation. And um, then for the past 20 years, I've been designing and writing video games, and I'm on my 40th game, which actually is having a soft launch in New Zealand. And thanks to Jesse Shell there in Pittsburgh, I got sort of stuck into this extra profession um, uh, of designing classrooms. Well, I was designing the classrooms as games, and then he told everybody about it uh, in, a, in a talk at DICE that ended up as a TED Talk, and that's how I became involved in now I do lots of workshops, and I, I just got back from Sweden. Uh, I was in Guadalajara earlier um, doing uh, workshops and, and speaking about how to uh, create uh, what I call multiplayer classrooms. So are there any new books in the works? I hope not. Um, no, I, 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 I'm writing a murder mystery. I am a, I'm basically a mystery writer, and for some reason I'm doing all this other stuff too. But uh, I'm... I, I'd rather write fiction, actually, than write um, things that I have to tell the truth in. That's funny. All right, how about you, Greg? Well, I'm, I, well I, I don't have nearly as interesting an introduction as any of you guys. I'm a reporter. Um, I cover education at USA Today. Um, I'm a former teacher. Um, and I really kind of went down this road uh, totally intending to do something else. Um, I got very interested in the fate of reading in America. I'd had an interesting conversation with one of my daughters about her favorite book, and it turned out she didn't have one. And it got me thinking, you know, this was a straight-A student who had no relationship to books. Um, and so I really started uh, kind of getting, I guess the right word is obsessed with young people's relationships with media. And inevitably, this would have been 2010, inevitably it to, took me down the path of thinking about and playing lots of games. Um, I didn't even really know why games were important at that point, but I just knew that they were. And I sort of indulged that a little bit and pretty soon started meeting teachers who were using games in the classroom. And that led to me writing a book that just came out last April called The Game Believes in You, How Digital Play Can Make Our Kids Smarter. And, uh, and I ha happen to know that I definitely have Lee's book on my shelf. Um, it was a huge uh, uh, kind of piece of really philosophical uh, um, grounding for a lot of what I was thinking about at the time. And if, it's, if, my, books are, uh, <laughs> if my books are properly shelved, it's in the S's, but I don't think they are. So, but it's back there someplace. <laughs> so, um, so, do you have another book in the works? Um, I I am just recovering from this one. <laughs> um, it just came out. It came out in April, so I'm basically I'm just sort of still selling it. Um, 
and just trying to kind of you know tell people about it, get the word out about it, and you know talk to I've been talking to a lot of uh, schools and um, trying to just sort of see what the landscape is in terms of teachers, not just using games, but also thinking a little bit more deeply about play and the role that play has in something that we think is serious, which is school. Yeah, That's the, one of the things that I've been trying to talk as much as I can about is that play has a place in that serious undertaking. I've got your book behind me. All right. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, this is a great crowd. I'm so excited everybody's here today because I think this is going to be a really good discussion. And I personally, one of the things that's just on the top of my mind is um, why do we, why, why do we use games in the classroom and what does that mean to each of us? So I'd like to pose the question, um, maybe top one or top three reasons why, you know, teachers um, or, you know, school administrators parents should understand that using games in the classroom is a good idea. Why is it a good idea? And I, I would just like to start by saying with Zulama, what we see is that um, we use video game design as a hook. We, you know, kids will sign up for these classes because they want to make video games. But once we get them hooked and we get them engaged, we have then the opportunity to do all kinds of wonderful things, like teach them other things while they are, you know, in grow, you know, very much involved in in making games. So for us, it's it's really about student engagement. Uh, really getting a project-based approach into the classroom and um, allowing interest-driven learning to happen and all the good things that surround those. And that's really Sulama's focus in terms of why we say games uh, have a place in the classroom. But can you all pipe in and you know give us your top reasons why? Anyone can jump in <laughs> first. No order. Um, I, I could say... Uh, one of the things that one of my grad students discovered is how far back using games in classrooms actually goes. I use a quote from Plato in 360 BC about using games to teach, and another quote from John Locke in 1692 about using games to teach. So they've been with us a long time, and we know that mammals learn through play. Mm -hmm. They learn survival skills through play, and, and I think we're mammals. Um, and the other thing is that we are in a resurgence of interest in games, uh, and this new kind of games, which are digital games and, and computer games and so on. So I think those two things have sort of collided favorably uh, to help us get uh, games uh, to teach. Mm -hmm. And what are the and so what are the outcomes that we're going what that we're going for when we say use games in the classroom? Why? Because why? Me again? Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, we're well. I mean, I we've we were. It used to be anecdotal when I used to talk to people about this. I could say, well, the average grade in the class went from a C to a B plus. The, the average grade on the last midterm was an A instead of a C. Um, but that's, I'm not a researcher. But now uh, we have Chris Haskell at uh, Boise State University who has surveyed 14,000 students, uh, 1,500 teachers, I can't remember exactly, but some huge amount of people. And he's finding even more, they, it sounds like we're on the back of a wagon selling uh, snake oil or something. Uh, <laughs> it's too good to be true. Out. Yeah, well, he, he, when, he, he compared... Uh, just teaching the regular way, sage on a stage or, or whatever, to games. And when they did the first one, uh, they came up with, I think it was 71% of the students either got an A, a B, or a C. The, um, then when they did it, they, he calls it quest-based learning. Mm -hmm. And when he did it as, as games, when they tested that, 90-something percent of the students got an A and there were no Bs and Cs. Uh, yeah. So that's a good reason to do it. Yeah. And I, mean, I, I should exactly. also say it doesn't have to be gamers. It yeah. also doesn't have to be people who know games. Some of the most receptive students are, are students that haven't played games. But we have it built into our DNA. Sorry, Sean. Mm -hmm. no, I, I'm sorry, Lee. I cut, came in a little early. Um, you know, I, Chris, Chris was out and visited last year and, and, and 
talked about some, somewhat about that. A large part of how he got those numbers was he developed a new learning management system called the, the 3D Game Lab, where you could start to tap into some of those um, environments where you can actually deliver quests as a unit of learning to your students. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the question about outcome, like, we're starting to see these kinds of things. And for me, I, I do like the classroom where we're looking at a limited number of classrooms and getting the same thing. Part of one of the things you're looking for is you can ramp up the rigor. So when I say to students, here's 70 quest options to choose from, any combination of these will meet my objectives as a teacher. And students make that initial choice, they own it. So there's this agency to it when they get to pick mm -hmm. what they're doing. Yeah. That is what play is all about. Is it's that voluntary contribution that really is kind of the golden egg that teachers have been looking for for years, where we want students to buy in. But the question of games is how do we design something that's worth buying into versus saying how do we trick them into, into buying into our curriculum. Yeah. Um, so even just that base level where Chris Haskell was able to deliver a quest um, and de develop quest trees where if I do one quest, three more open up and you create these kind of branching paths through your classroom. First of all, they're fast and fascinating to, to play through as a, an instructor in that kind of class environment. You get to really get to know your kids based on the choices mm -hmm. they and that creates a playful environment, I think, for the teacher, too, which is one of those outcomes where when we're at our best as teachers and instructors and professors, I think our students are going to pull a lot more off of us, too. So that, I, I mean, that kind of piggybacks on what Lee was saying, mm -hmm. um, where we just see, but it's apples and oranges to the old model. So, you know, some of the results I was seeing in my classes is I was having students do an hour-ish of homework per week to where that number is jumping up to where they're doing binge questing on the weekends. They'll get together <laughs> with their classmates and spend eight hours just doing as many quests as they can do. And yeah. that's the kind of playful environment I want to have in my class. It's bad for balance, like they need to do other things in their life. Um, but I, as an instructor, I just love that kind of temptation to want to just binge quest on the weekend. But it means good design. It means you have to mm -hmm. look at how game designers actually design games and try to, to replicate that to some extent. That's hard to do. So, Todd, you know, you're one who's in the line of fire in terms of using games in the school district in Elizabeth Forward. How do you address that about, you know, concern about, I mean, you have test scores that you have to report to, and how, how do you think about um, whether using games is going to be a positive or a negative? How do you defend you guys using that? Using well, I, I think we got to step back. Six years ago, when we came to Elizabeth Ford, there was no written curriculum. There were um, none of our curriculum uh, that the teachers were using. I think were aligned to the state standards. So, really, for the first two years, we spent time defining our curriculum, aligning it to the state standards, uh, looking at data. Um, but we put a, a, a data and curriculum tool in the software piece. So, the first two years was just you know really becoming data driven, focusing on our curriculum, and then. The last four years has been focusing on lesson design and how do we get students more engaged and how do we get um, kids to a deeper level of learning and how do we how do we get all kids to master learning and and game based learning really just came about uh, you know working with the Entertainment Technology Center Carnegie Mellon um, Minecraft.edu you know we were just started to dabble in you know boy. If, while kids are playing these games, these educational games, they're more engaged. Um, and we all know that we have a different type of learner now. Um, you know, the, it's funny, I always say that these kids grew up on Webkins. And if you don't know what Webkins is, ask a four-year-old, um, because now they get a stuffed animal. They don't play with the stuffed animal. They play in this virtual world. And, um, and after talking to a four-year-old for 10 seconds, they're going to lose you on how they're keeping their stuffed animal alive in this virtual world and how they're, you know, working or uh, uh, having conversation with other, other uh, uh, kids and, you know, in their neighborhood virtually. Um, so we have a different type of learner and, you know, we spent a lot of time trying to understand that. And we also realize it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that, you know, worksheet after worksheet and 100 uh, slide PowerPoints are not working. Um, you know, Lee talked about the sage on the stage, and we know that that, that model is not working um, in the information age. So, you know, that's where we started to really focus on lesson design and engaging kids in, in amazing lessons, and game-based learning just came about. Uh, why not, you know, have a kid 
uh, use a math game on an iPad, and now they're able to master the Pythagorean theorem. You know, instead of doing worksheet after worksheet and only getting half the kids to to master that concept. So really, that's how the school district came about. And in in reality, too, according to the Pittsburgh Business Times, we've moved up a hundred. There's 500 school districts in the state of Pennsylvania. In short six short years, we've moved up 150 spots according to the Pittsburgh Business Times. Kudos to Elizabeth Forward. <laughs> Thank you. But it, it's, it's, you know, it's about lesson design and engaging kids, and that's kind of how the approach the week, you know, went went towards, and, and game-based learning just kind of fell in our lap. Yeah. So what about the teachers, then? How do you all um, convince the teachers that this is something that, that, they, that they should jump off the cliff? <laughs> um, and this is a talk that I, I'm asked to deliver as well um, that um, actually it's getting easier I used to say in the earlier talks well you know any kids uh, born after 1975 are in the gamer generation now I can say any teachers and parents born <laughs> 1975 are in the gamer generation too um, I, 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 it, you have to show you can't tell you have to let them see yep. what the experience is like in the classroom. When I have teachers come into my classroom and the kids are cheering and hugging each other and running around and everything and having a great time and learning, um, that's what that's the biggest sales tool, particularly for teachers. And um, some people say, well, what do I do with superintendents and, 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 and so on? And I say, I think it's better to build from the ground up. Have one teacher in one school it, uh, who, who's like a virus Mm -hmm. and, and somebody comes in from next door because they hear the kids laughing, and then that person wants to try something, and uh, all, and so it, it, it builds from that. And, it, and it's important that the teachers who start out don't start out um, with this whole hog, you know, multiplayer classroom or quest-based learning or whatever it is. I, I, I tell them, start out by not penalizing your kids for coming not coming to class. Start out by giving them XP for coming to class. It's a positive thing. It's a carrot instead of a stick. Uh, start out by letting them learn by failing. Start out by using intrinsic rewards instead of badges. Um, they already got the badges. They're called grades. Uh, and they need more they mean they need more hugs. Mm -hmm. I mean I if I can just sort of build on that, you know, one of the things that I found was was that you didn't really have to persuade teachers that as Lee says it was sort of this viral bottom-up thing um, that uh, the the reform, if you want to call it that, is almost the opposite of what teachers are used to, which is someone from above tells them, you must do this. Mm -hmm. um, what, I, what I found <clears throat> almost in every, every school I went was just what Lee is describing, which is this, you know, one or two teachers does it almost sort of subver subversively and gets results that they really like, gets mm -hmm. kids really interested in something, and so the idea just spreads. Um, well, I remember that's kind of what happened at Elizabeth Forward when we started with Zulama. I mean, they renovated a room so that it looked more like a studio. Yeah. Um, so it's a cool space. Yeah. And then they put the Zulama curriculum in there, and then so students are, um, you know, making games and playing games, and, you know, you walk by this room and you look in, and it looks like organized chaos, right? Yeah. But these kids are highly engaged. They're, they're jumping up and down. They're working on projects together. And, um, you know, I, I heard from the teachers that what started happening is that other teachers would kind of walk by and peer in and, you know, have conversations with them afterwards, after mm -hmm. class, about, you know, what are you doing in there? And, yeah. Can we do some of that in our other classes? Because you know, I, my kids are all falling asleep in my classes, and your kids are all hopping around, you know, like there's no tomorrow, and they don't even want to leave your classroom. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like you said, it's, it's modeling it, actually just seeing it in action is, you know, a picture's worth, you know, more than a thousand words. I guess, I guess, one of the things that I want to make sure that I add is that I think teachers are smart, and they. They, just because something's more fun or because, because the classroom is more sort of engaging and exciting, I don't think is enough. I mean, I think it was Sean who said, you know, there's got to be more rigor. Right. Um, and I think, to, to me, one of the really interesting things from my perch, having covered education for, for over a decade, was that what I saw was these two sort of grand traditions. On the one hand, we had people saying school has to be more rigorous, 
And on the other hand, we had people saying school has to be more fun and more engaging and kids need to want to come to Lee's Point. It can be both, and, right? Well, I mean, <laughs> and, and, and what I found was is when I was doing the reporting for the book, this was the first time that two sides were talking to one another, and actually they were, they were not, it wasn't two sides talking to one another, it was the same people who believed both of these things could happen at the same time, and I think that's really key here. Yeah. One without the other is, to me, kind of, you know, it's, we wouldn't even be sitting here talking if we had one without the other. I agree. One of the, for me, the, the biggest issue isn't convincing parents or other teachers on that level, it's the idea that they're, they're trying to standardize education everywhere, right? So that, um, and, and how do you standardize education? You use multiple choice questions, really? Um, and as a result, it's like they're trying to create education for the computers because the computers get happy with the numbers and they can do that. That's why uh, extrinsic rewards are so easy to give out because computers love them. Humans don't necessarily love them any more than a hug. But computers don't know from hugs. What are they going to do with a hug? <laughs> so it's that that level where right now I think it's hey there you go that uh, <laughs> that that's the level that we have to work on. And um, I but I, I do st still see it being sur uh, um, subversive as somebody said, working from the ground up, creating a revolution, and then they turn around. Whenever there's an alien that comes into a community. <laughs> um, it is, uh, it, it, at first everybody goes, ooh, 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 what's that, what's that, what's that, right? The parents. And then and this could be an alien idea, it can be just somebody not from the neighborhood, whatever. And then the kids start to find it first. And then as the kids <laughs> find it, then then uh, the parents say, well, what the hell, we got to get rid of that. <laughs> but uh, then after a while, the, they start to come over to that side, right? The parents are next, and it kind of just flows upwards rather than trickling down. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. You know, Ollie, what you're saying, like that idea of how do you get teachers to jump on? I think what I hear you saying is there's not a cliff here. There's there's developmental ways where teachers can start to do these things, and the the rationale for it isn't hard to get across at all. You know, mm -hmm. more engaged students, better scores, uh, you know, activity and cheering and yelling. But that's not hard to argue for. But giving those portals as to how do you start doing this as a teacher, I think that that part's really you know, a couple suggestions that I run into with teachers a lot is one is go to your students, show them your standards for the next unit if you want to do standards, and say, what are projects we can do where when you finish this project, I can see that you've done it. And let's open the door to games and learning and you designing computer. And students will help you write those assignments. You don't have to be a games expert to do that because it's such a ubiquitous media for youth right now. They, they know the game mechanics and they can say, well, what if we did this? or or that, and teachers still have a good instinct for what's valuable and what's not, and you just kind of do a dialogue with your students, and it's real easy. Or even as an extra credit project, say, here's my assignments that I did last year, or the past 20 years, and just say, but if you want to do an extra credit project and show me what something would look like that covers the same kind of material and bring it to the class and show it to us, I think so much of this is there are really, it's not a cliff, it's like going over a speed bump. <laughs> not that hard to start to, because the media is so pervasive <clears throat> that yeah. the, the gamers know how to do gaming. Yeah. So teachers really just need to open up the idea that maybe there's there's additional ways to study for a test, you know, and, and having students run back and forth and grab answers, you know, I, I think that's one of those kind of gems that you find out there where you can turn your classroom into that daily activity. And I like Lee, what you said, we've been doing this for millenniums. Uh, it, it's it's that we really need to do it in an era where, you know, we have so many pressures on teachers to do things, and and we have to get through set number of standards. So I think having that. The other thing is with Minecraft, right? Um, a lot of teachers get intimidated just because they don't know the game. So if you're talking about bringing off-the-shelf video games into your classroom, that's one of those things where the extra credit project can really help open teachers' eyes to showing like what exactly can be done in those spaces. Mm -hmm. They think a computer game is like Pac-Man, uh, if they're not familiar with them. But computer games are entirely different than what a lot of teachers imagine that they are. And they just don't have time to go check out you know, 15, 20 computer games to find the one for your classroom. And that's yeah, another but... issue, because there are a number... Of, I, I, I'm sorry, but I think like 95% of all games uh, that purport to teach are, are crap. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and there, I mean, there's a lot of people out there making a living. Chocolate covered broccoli, right? <laughs> chocolate covered broccoli, and the teachers don't have a real easy way of knowing what what are the good games. They look, we get game developers who don't have instructional designers working on their games, and it looks beautiful, and the teachers see it, and then the and then the uh, the um, administration puts out money for that, and then it doesn't do anything special except they really enjoy doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I know I'm, I'm working on a committee at, at the IGDA, and also there's another new organization now called HEVGA, which mm -hmm. is Higher Education Video Game Alliance um, that was started by, um, yeah, Jesse and Constance and, and a whole bunch of people oh, we right. know, Andy Phelps. And um, there's a group, I'm on that too, trying to come up with standards as, for two things, not just the fun, but also that the pedagogy is working. And rather than having these, I, I hate to say it, kind of phony conferences where people pat each other on the back and give each other reward, uh, awards, they're getting their extrinsic <laughs> rewards, but um, it's, it's really suspect as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. So we have a bunch of like-minded thinkers here. I always feel like our biggest challenge with Zulama is just getting the word out. And you know, we're talking about it's only a speed bump, but you know, f education changes very slowly, and you know, our kids are sort of racing by us. Um, but education is taking a lot longer to catch up with, I think, our, the ideas we're talking about here and also the way our kids are just starting to almost self-motivate self and self-educate. So in terms of advocacy or awareness building, I mean, what, what I know you, you know, we've got some published authors here. I know a, a lot of you are good at, you know, speaking at conferences and blogging, but what else can we do to kind of get the word out and, and get this more into mainstream education? Nikki, I'll, I'll chime in that. I think that, I think we got to get our uh, politicians more involved in the schools and, and understand what's happening at the state level and in any department of education. You know, just like Lee said, it's more standard-based. Um, you know, the, the the Pennsylvania adopted the Common Core; they call it the PA Core. Teachers are just feeling overwhelmed. They they feel like you know, introducing games in in schools um, is just going to bog down all the curriculum. They're tying the test scores to teachers' evaluations. I think it's just difficult, and I think you know, trying to do that paradigm shift where you know, if your kid plays this game or we can do more personalized learning for students using gameplay. Um, we can get more done and, and meet the needs of all kids in the classroom. But I think it's a, it's a huge paradigm shift. But, you know, we're driven by test scores and published in newspapers, and, and that just scares, um, you know, it scares teachers to take that, that, that chance. Um, but, you know, we're, uh, Elizabeth Ford, we're a great example where we took that chance, and, and uh, um, it's really paying off for us and our, and our, our teachers you know they're redesigning their classrooms now. There's no desk really in a row anymore, and and it's just um, they're more facilitators. And and um, even when we went to personalized learning at the elementary level several years ago, the teachers had a hard time with kids learning stuff that they haven't taught yet. And but they were learning it. Um, and then when the teacher actually started to introduce some of the material, like oh I learned that on eSpark or I learned that on one of the quests that I I covered. And so it, it's kind of evolving as we're getting deeper now into learning um, through gameplay but but again I think that we gotta we gotta approach the politicians and, and get them in our schools and help them understand because they're the ones that are making the laws and in, in, you know our state so I think there's also a fear that teachers think they maybe get supplanted I think it's important to understand that I think for me anyway the games that work the best when I when I'm creating games that are are not just classrooms designed as games, but uh, um, games for specific courses and things like that, that the teachers understand that I'm supplementing their work and that they're meant to still have face-to-face -face talks with the teacher and the teacher is still supposed to help with the difficult concepts because we can't program that all into a game. Mm -hmm. These games that pretend that they can teach an entire course uh, are often they're, they're doomed to failure right from the start without that human being in there to sort of keep things flowing. 
Yeah, I think I, in, I think in general people have this weird view of computers as these, like Lee says, these sort of machines that are going to replace them. And I mean, that's not a very constructive or helpful way to think about it. I mean, you know, I mean, computers may replace some jobs. I mean, I don't have an accountant to do my taxes, right? Because I have TurboTax. But you know, a good teacher is never going to be replaced. Um, I mean, I, I to me, I think that the, the way to think of it is is that you know, the beginning of the computer revolution. You know, we had essentially two schools of thought, right? We had artificial intelligence, and we had computers as sort of expanding the human mind. And I think that's where more people need to kind of start thinking about, the, you know, what computers can do. They can they can basically take a good teacher and help them be really really great. Um, but but they but it's not going to replace a good teacher. Um, I mean, if anything, though, I think the thing that uh, teachers need to think more about is how much control are they willing to give up, um, and are they comfortable with that? I mean, I don't know what what you folks, you know, who are actually you know in academia, um, what your experience w is with this. But the teachers that I talked to said, you know, it was sort of the moment when they realized that they couldn't control everything. That they that games started to sort of come alive, um, that they had to hand a little bit of control over to their students. Um, so I don't know if, if anybody has any thoughts on that. Well, there's there's classroom authority, which the institution yeah. gives you as the teacher, but then there's personal relationship authority, which you get by having a meaningful relationship with a child. Most teachers get into education because they want the meaningful relationship, that authentic mm -hmm. engagement. Mm -hmm. and when you were talking, Greg, I was thinking a little bit about it's not that computers would replace teachers, it's what can computers do that are a complete waste of teachers' time. Right, that's right. Like, I don't want to spend my weekend grading tests. Who wants to do that? So do your test on a Google form and have your students come up and see their score two seconds after they're done. Yeah. That's a kind of design question that I get real inspired when I see people like Lee you know, or, or, or Jesse Shell writing about game design, that they think that they ask those questions as designers, is what do we, what's the task we want our players spending their time on? But you can ask that same question of teachers. You know, do you, and, and when, when I'll go in, and we did a thing with the district last year where we had district level PD for all the teachers, and I would just walk around during their, their professional days, and I would find the teachers with stacks of papers on their desk saying, isn't that boring? Do you yeah. really want to spend how long is that going to take you to get through that pile? And is that a valuable use of your time, or would you rather be using that time interacting with students? Mm -hmm. That's so, a good point. Um, and this is part of the thinking behind flipping the classroom, right? Like, do you really want to give a lecture and have 30 people sit in their chairs? What, what would happen if athletic coaches did that? You'd have horrible sports teams. <laughs> do the instruction on a video and let kids watch it 20 times. Let them pause it. Let them have this design element in your class that, that's useful to students and actually accommodates with a lot of developmental disabilities where when you get into the classroom, let's not waste our time lecturing. That's not a productive use of your time. Let's get great lectures and bring them in. And what a teacher really does is that personal relationship, which I think is best suited to giving feedback on student products. Mm -hmm. That's where a teacher can give a lens to a student and give them feedback on what to do next that really is where the rigor comes from. It's that individualized feedback on projects that's rich and robust where a student can run back to their desk and go do it right now. Mm -hmm. um, but we're not wasting our time. I, I think lectures are kind of a waste of a teacher's time. They're not doing what a teacher does best, which is that personal relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think when teachers embrace that a little bit, it's not as intimidating to think that computers can actually help save them time. Yeah, I, um, that's why I have the students do all the teaching. Um, <laughs> It takes a lot more prep up front, but once they're there and doing the, their peers, so they listen to them, they, in order to teach, we actually have to know what we're talking about, which also helps, and um, they learn to present. I mean, we have really three different ways now of how people move up through their careers uh, in terms of communication. We have written, good written communication, good verbal communication, and presenting ideas. I separate that out from verbal. It's getting your ideas across to people. And uh, you know, I try to do that all the time. Once I get all my prep done, I sit at the back and I, uh, I'm the game master. And if, if, they're, if they start to go off track, I pull them back on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I have a question for, the, for, for you guys, if you don't mind. Can, can I 
Can I jump in with a question? Go for it. You know, I mean, you know, we, we're talking about how sort of slowly education changes. And, you know, to me, what one of the promising signs is this idea that so many adults, you know, like Lee was saying, you know, all the, everybody born after 1975, right? I just made that. Well, but, <laughs> but I mean, you know, so think about this, though, Lee. You know, your typical teacher who's just starting his or her career was born in the early 90s. Yeah. Born in the early 90s. So, um, you know, there's this really interesting phenomenon to me, which is that everyone is a gamer now, right? Mm -hmm. You know, teachers and students alike, when they go home for, for the day, you know, they're lying in bed with an iPad, you know, they're playing games. They get it on a very deep level. And I guess, I mean, the, the, the stupid joke that I like to say is, like, nobody has an overhead projector in their house, right? Um, that's just a technology that we don't use as... as or right? a smart board. Yeah, or a smart right. board. Real people. And I guess, you know, to me, I, I sort of see a lot of potential in this idea that this is, a, this is a piece of technology that is a part of our lives in a very deep way. So I think it has a real potential to to kind of maybe a flip is not the right word, but you know to really change things quickly. And I just wonder, I mean, am I being too like over eager about this, or or I mean, what am I missing here? Um, <clears throat> I don't think you're being too over eager. <laughs> I don't think there is any such thing. Yeah. Um, I I think that if we're not eager. They won't be eager. I mean, how do you yeah. win anybody over? So yeah. you have. I think I leapt in with both feet because I didn't have any path to follow when I started doing this. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm. I now I had that extra thing, which was I was a professional game designer, which actually helped. I can't believe two things. One, that it took me two years of teaching to to realize that reading from uh, a textbook is not the way to teach and that maybe I should design the class as a game because that's what I do. And yeah. then just my, my next thing was when I realized that narrative is really important. And that isn't, that isn't even in the, the, the book, but I now do, do a lot of talking about collateral learning, which is basically I get them so interested in what's going to happen next, I tie all the lessons together in narratives. And uh, as a result, I'm teaching with emotion, with characters, with all these other things that were my tools as a writer. But it took me forever to figure that out too. But if I don't, if I'm not eager about it, it's not going to go anyplace. Mm -hmm. So no, you know, let me pat you on the head. You're not being too eager. <laughs> I still think that there's, um, just with that comment about education and it moving slowly and it, whether we're being over eager, even us as a group, um, there still are, to me, there are still a lot of disparate groups within any given school district. It's true that the teachers are mostly coming, who are starting their careers, are already digital natives as well, but there are a lot of teachers who are still teaching and have been doing it for a long time who haven't, who are still in those schools. and and the administrators tend to be not in this super newer, younger generation. The administrations tend to be a more mature crowd right now. And I will say, even among parents, I mean, I have two sons who are now in college, but as a parent, it's something that we always struggle with about screen time and game time. And even as an avid gamer myself, um, I still struggled with that with my, with my own two kids. So it's, I feel like it isn't 100% cut and dry. Um, whether we embrace this sort of new world or not. Yeah, Nikki, I think that, um, well, a, a, a couple thoughts. One, um, I think it's okay to, to, not, to, to not be too enthusiastic. I think it's okay to say, not, and Lee hinted at this, not all games are great for learning environments. Yep. You know, Clash of Clans is wonderful, and, and there's, a semi, there's a semiotic system there to learn, obviously, and I can get strategies around it, and I can mm -hmm. learn mechanics there. Mm -hmm. But they're not necessarily, you know, institutionally recognized, you know, relevant information in that game. Right. But is the game good for learning? Great. Yeah, sure. Is it great for schools? And I think sometimes being a little sober about that is actually more convincing for teachers. Mm -hmm. and, and we see a lot of enthusiasm because the people that have jumped in and tried this, they're not going back. Um, but I also, I, I wonder about your thought of incoming teachers being digital natives. I don't know if I see that. Um, yeah. 
a lot of the teachers I work with, and even when we did the Minecraft study, it was it was teachers between years five and seven that were a lot more likely to try new things in their classroom. And those first few years as a teacher, you're learning the system, you're terrified, um, <laughs> trying to figure out how to do classroom management. Um, it, before you realize that you don't manage a classroom, you design a classroom. Mm -hmm. And when it's well designed, there's not a lot of management to do anymore. You, you really let it run itself and enjoy it. Yeah. Um, it, those kinds of things are, I think, teacher training questions. Where, where Todd, as a superintendent, he has teacher training to do after the teacher is hired and they get out of my programs, where they they have to learn that this is culturally acceptable to do this in the district, uh, and they've got people and veteran teachers they can reach out to and talk to. Um, but we see a lot of teachers coming in. I don't I don't know that that idea of digital natives is something that that I see. Um, I'm not disagreeing with it. But oh, fine. a lot of people going into education because they don't want to be on a computer. They want to be working. <laughs> that's not. That's a very interesting observation. Yeah. I, I like to uh, answer uh, Greg's uh, question too. I think that the standardized testing, uh, you know, from from the movement in the in the late '90s till now, you know, we swung so far the pendulum for standardized testing. It's driving all our schools, and I think that. We're not going to change what's happening in education until that standardized testing changes. I, I, you know, you have some great schools out there that are performing very well on standardized tests. Why should they change? You know, there's a lot of schools in in the Pittsburgh region or you know top schools in the state. Why should they have to change anything they've been doing and kind of been doing the same thing for 30 or 40 years, 50 years? Um, there's no reason for them to change. And at least that's what their their mindset is. Um, so I think if we start to swing back a little bit, I remember in the 80s, my teacher, uh, we we had a project-based learning. I remember like it was like it was yesterday in middle school where uh, we wrapped the Bill of Rights. He let us, hey, learn the Bill of Rights. Any way you want to learn it, learn it. And we used a tape cassette. Um, most kids don't even know what a tape cassette player is now, but um, and a microphone, and we wrapped the, the, the Bill of Rights. And, and I think those those opportunities are less and less for kids. Uh, and yes, I could still wrap it, but um, I think it's less and less because we're just so driven by um, the multiple choice standardized tests, and I think teachers are just extremely, extremely afraid to let go um, and to, to be more creative in their classroom. And I think administrators are too. I mean, you know, we're we're firing teachers, we're firing administrators based on standardized tests, and um, you know, I, I don't think we got to get rid of them totally, but I think that there has to be some happy medium into where we were in the early 90s to, to now and you know it's, you know it's just that's a struggle for teachers that they, they don't want to let go and that eagerness of changing classrooms and getting students more engaged is it's it's hard to let go for them and uh, some of the new teachers that we get into our school you know they're not used to all this technology every kid having an iPad and personalized learning and, and it is overwhelming for the first couple of years but I have some teachers or second third year teachers I'd put against any teacher in the country they're just amazing what they do with technology but yeah. um, and I also think that I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking here but you know some of the programs out there like Brain Rush, Nolan Bushnell's uh, company uh, we do a lot of uh, game based kind of learning and practicing using brainrush.com uh, and uh, our teachers are you know they're I, I can say K-12 to we're, we're doing a lot of game-based learning and, and uh, our kids are engaged, they really are. And um, We had 72 kids in outside cyber charter schools six years ago. They didn't have to attend. In Pennsylvania, you, you don't have to go to the district you actually uh, live in. They can go to cyber charter school. Today, uh, 72 six years ago, we're down to nine kids um, in outside cyber charter school. Kids want to be here to Elizabeth Ford, which is awesome to see. Yeah, and if I could, I could jump in here towards towards the end of the hour. Um, I think it's been exciting to sort of hear all you talk about it. I think what we've learned is that, you know, gaming and education have been bedfellows for quite a long time, and we're just sort of going over the digital speed bump that you talked about earlier. And I think it takes sort of the reporting of Greg and the enthusiasm of leaders in the field like Lee and the the research from Sean and enterprising administrators like Todd and game designers like Nikki to help make this all happen and sort of push us all over that that speed bump that you talked about. And additionally, I think the work of things like the Remake Learning Network that we're doing here in Pittsburgh to help tell this story and really bring a lot of people uh, into the conversation in this sort of networked fashion is, is what's going to tie it all together and, and sort of move us forward collectively. So, um, you know, I, I thank you guys for your participation today. I'm going to have to jump off. Um, but just want to thank Nikki and Todd and everybody for being a part of it.
sure. um, and just keep pushing ahead. Thanks a lot, Dustin. Yeah. Till next time. And Lee, I know you have to hop off soon. Do you have any final thoughts for the group? Um. Oh no, I. That's such an open-ended thing. I know. Um, well, we each get a chance to kind of, you know, oh, retract, kind of wrap redact, or wrap up. Um, I, 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 <laughs> I, would, I would only wish that we keep focused on the human, uh, and not the tech, and that whether or not uh, you're going to do a class that is designed as a game that has no tech in it, which can be done in a field, or whether you're going to bring tech into it, that the human element is still there. I, I, I think that's incredibly important. So mm -hmm. that's humans. That's my final thought. <laughs> Who else? Anybody else want to? I, I, have, I have a final thought, which, which may not turn into a final thought because people might push back against it, but I'll say it anyway. You know, as I've been talking to people about my book and about this topic in general, one of the things that I've been saying is that I really hope gaming is not the next big thing because the next big thing just always sucks. <laughs> and we, just get, we get over it very quickly and then move on to the next big thing. Um, I mean, the, the, this silly metaphor that I use, and this is push back on this if you like, but um, I say, you know, gaming, in, gaming and education should be like pencil sharpeners. That is, you know, every classroom in America has two pencil sharpeners, right? It's got the one on the wall that you crank and it eats everybody's pencil. And then you've got the one on the teacher's desk that actually works, right? And that's the one that everyone <laughs> uses. And that's the one that the teacher probably saw that it worked in someone else's room, went out and bought it at, for 15 bucks at Staples. And nobody really even comments on it. They just use it because it's a better tool. Um, I, I, and I, I personally, I feel like that's the smarter way to go. Um, and I think it's going to be the more sustainable way to go. Anyway, but it'll take a longer time. Well, personally, I don't have any pushback on that at all. In fact, I think that's exactly what, what we're up to with Ulam and uh -huh. this idea that I mean, we feel like we can. We're going to change the way education happens. That mm -hmm. it isn't. Oh, it's video game design that students yeah. are all of a sudden going to learn. That's really not it at all. Mm -hmm. It's that we're shifting to a more project-based learning approach, and um, you know that teachers are facilitators, and that and that we happen to have a great tool and a great curriculum and a great teacher training program that can help move stu schools in that direction. There's oh. other ways they can do that as well. There's other ways they can help m be moved in that direction. But I don't view it as the next best thing at all. I think it's the way it's the way education is going to happen. It's the way schools are just going to be. It's going to be the new modality in schools. Mm -hmm. At least that's what I hope. All right. <laughs> I've got to go. All right, so I've got to go teach a class that I've designed as a game. That's Thank great. you so much. Have fun. I like how Lee took us from aliens to humans. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> Glad it wasn't the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> okay, bye, everybody. Bye, bye Lee. Lee. Thank you. I think I, I take away from this, and this is, I think, right in line with what you said, Greg, is that technology is only worth our time if it makes things more efficient or yep. more effective. And we have to give teachers as much, as much license to say no mm -hmm. to some of these curriculum things we're throwing at them as, as if either it makes their life more efficient or it's better teaching. It's more effective. And if it doesn't fit one of those two categories, we have to learn judgment around technology. And I, and I think that that's why we spent a billion dollars on interactive whiteboards. I pick on them a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, but we sold a product to educators across the world and I don't blame the market, the people selling the product. Good for them. But they sold a product that didn't essentially bring anything new to the table. Hmm. And, or, or to the board, I should say. Yeah. Um, and you could say, well, kids can interact with it. Oh, well, that's great. But, but as it turns out, that's not actually how those generally get used in classrooms. But with games and education, and you're using computers and digital tools and digital worlds and virtual environments and cheap production editing tools, for them to design their own games, that's different. That's students doing something different. Hmm. I like to me that's exciting. I agree with you, Greg. It shouldn't be the next big thing. We've always thought in education that our job is to help kids produce, to produce essays when essays were a big deal and you had 
the Reader's Digest coming to most of the homes in the country. Um, but today we want them producing, we just have different media that we want them producing with. So it is a literacy issue. It is a being a, an empowered person in our world. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. They should know how to use a pencil sharpener, and they should also know how to use a, a, a CAD editor, and they should know how to use you know some of these tools that are cheap, free, and available, and mm -hmm. are doorways into jobs. And I'm not all, education's not just about jobs. I agree with Lee. We should focus on the human. But creation is a human endeavor. And that's where I get excited about game design in the classroom or even bringing games into the classroom. Because I want students engaging with the media that they see in the world around them. Mm -hmm. And it's not some abstract idea they're learning in the classroom. They're actually learning production around those abstract ideas. And yeah. to me, it's really exciting. I like to see it with Minecraft, with mobile games. Um, all of it, that's where, it, for me, it gets real exciting. It's where Greg gets to write whole books about this. Stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. How about you, Todd? Any final thoughts for today? Well, I, I personally think education's not that hard. We make it harder than it really <laughs> is. Um, equity issue in education, I think, is very, very difficult. But in general, teaching kids and engaging kids, I, I don't think it's that difficult. But, you know, we're, we're, we're going to... Um, badges, we're trying to do, you know, all these new things, and I, I laughed when Lee said, you know, uh, all these new things out there, and, and, and a lot of them are, aren't very good, but um, you know, career readiness and all this stuff that I hear from the state level, it's just, you know, we make it way, way too uh, too difficult, and, and um, you know, I think it, as an educator, I've been at it for a over 20, little over 20 years now, I think that... Uh, it's about engaging lessons. It's about trying to take our lessons to a deeper level of learning. And if game based, uh, if games can help us in some some of our content, let's do it. Um, I love uh, and what we didn't talk about as much as I thought we would have would be um, the failure. You know, you can fail at a game. We all were terrible when we first played Angry Birds, but we continue to play and we got better and better and better. And that's what I like about games and education that we can continue to. Um, kid, kids can, they don't feel that sense of that, that failure word as being a, such a negative thing in education. Right. They can keep playing a game if it's Pythagorean theorem, you know, focus on Pythagorean theorem or synonyms or antonyms or whatever it is and continue to play and play and play until they master that content. And um, I think that's, that's so cool for kids. I think that kids get frustrated when they get their paper back and it's, you know, red marks all over it. Um, let them do it again. Let them do it mm -hmm. and continue to play. So Yeah, I would agree with that. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. Fail faster. I like that, Sean. Absolutely. <laughs> and then pick and then pick yourself up and do it all over again and keep at it and keep at it. So, thank you all for this enlightening conversation today. Um, if there's anything that you do or don't want to have in the show notes, make sure you communicate that to Sarah. I think she'll probably pretty much be taking everything that's in our Google Doc and making sure that's in the show notes. So links to the books and your websites and things like that will be in there unless you tell her that you don't want them in there. Um, and I'm just really ha thrilled to have made connection with this group and to know that we're all kind of working towards the same, to the, to the same uh, sort of slightly uphill battle that I think is getting less and less uphill by the day. I will say I think that um, the climate of education is really changing for the positive and um, you know that we're all and I'm excited to be a, a part of it um, and, and really it's all about the kids and when I see the effect that we're having when you know students look at us and tell us what a difference we're making in their lives or we you know teachers look at us and say you know this is a, you know my teaching has really changed and I'm re-energized in what I'm doing that's really what makes the difference so um, that's what we that's what we're focused on is what's it what's in it for the kids and making sure it's it's all good for the kids so yeah. Yeah. So anyway, thank you all. Thanks for putting it, putting it all together. Sure, Thanks sure. Good conversation. Really appreciate it. And yeah. Todd, um, if I'm ever out in Pittsburgh, I'd love to visit your district. It sounds like uh, amazing things out there. Anytime. Anytime you'd want to come out, let us know, and uh, uh, we're glad to have you out here. All right. Thanks a lot. Take care, Thanks, guys. Folks. Thanks, everyone. See you later.